that we understand today that may not be around next, uh, tomorrow. But uh, data entry will take a different form. We know about speech recognition as a formal data entry. And we used to, I don't know, if you are more than 40 years old, you probably remember the OCR concept. But maybe for younger people, you, you don't really remember that. So, so things are changing very fast. But what we, one thing for sure is that there will be new skill sets required for the future. And the future is not far from now. It may be five years from now. So what do we have to do about this? We see that many countries are preparing themselves. Of course, almost everyone who are concerned about the future of the people, the future of the, their nation, will have to start thinking about preparing the, the people. We have two examples here. I'm, I'm sure you go to the, the, the net, you'll find hundreds, if not thousands of examples of how each country is investing investing the resources, in investing the energy to ensure that we prepare ourselves. So in, 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 we know that in Singapore, Singapore is always a good example to look at. Uh, what they are doing, they have uh, this thing called skills future, where the government is putting in uh, resources, even offering cash to individuals, to citizens, to upskill themselves, to reskill themselves. But very simple, because if you do not think about continuing to improve the knowledge, the ability to, to adapt, you'll be left behind. And you, nobody's going to be happy. Not only that the individual won't get a job, the individual won't be able to do anything, they start blaming people, and the productivity of a country will just drop. When the productivity of a country drops, you can't compete. When you can't compete, then you'll be left behind. So it's a cycle. And obviously, the other one is in, in uh, Italy, same thing, bring up digital project, started late last year as well, by the, the transition worker, perhaps. And then what are we doing in Malaysia? <coughs> We're very proud to share with you. I hope you have heard about this. If you have not, this is a very exciting, exciting um, uh, initiative that is, uh, there was launched in Malaysia officially in August this year. But we started this much earlier in a smaller scale pilot, uh, uh, pilot implementation in selected uh, schools. We call it My Digital Maker. See, Maker is about getting people to start making things. Because when you start making things, you look at, you start to ask questions, you start to investigate, you start to design, you start to plan. So it's a very good way to bring up the, the curiosity of individuals, especially a child. That's why we want it to be a maker. And we add the word digital as well. As you can make a lot of that is digital. We want to, what is digital maker then? You know, robotic, coding, programming, including even content creation, everything that is making use of digital as a platform is what we are interested in. There are four tracks that we have inside there. And uh, we, we must say that it's, it's something is really getting a lot of attention and also a lot of participation from all walks of life. How we are doing this? We support the MOE to integrate computational thinking and computer science into the national curriculum. That means by doing this, every single school kid, everyone again, everyone, will have a chance to be exposed. And that's very important. At that early stage, you don't pay so-called pick the winner, even though it, they, that may not be the best way to say But we believe that you must expose everybody. You, if you don't expose it to them, that means they, they are never given a chance to even start. You that interest in your qualification. And it's not only happening in it's happening all over the world now. We're trying to get kids involved in creating stuff and so on, which is really amazing. But the time is short and we have to give time to the next presenter. Uh, she is Her Excellency Dr. Aisha Shihab. She's the Minister of Education, Minister of Education Maldives. I'm just going to give you a short introduction before I lay it out here. Uh, uh, she has been in the public service since 1982. She served the education sector in the field of teaching, education and counseling. 
She served the Ministry of Youth and Sports in various capacities, including uh, the portfolio of the Minister of Youth and Sports. And her session or her talk is about ocean, friend or foe, using innovative IT solutions to transform challenges into opportunities for the Maldives education system. So I leave it to the speaker and please uh, inspire us. So please give a warm welcome for the... Uh, <laughs> Maldives is a tiny island nation with a population of 345,000 scattered across an area of 90,000 square kilometers <coughs> in the Indian Ocean. The Maldives, located on top of a vast underwater mountain range, have around 1,190 islands. Resembling a string of pearls, these islands have a total land area of only 298 kilometers. Maldives is 99% sea and less than 1% land. The island nation has no comparison in the world in terms of its unique geography and topography. It is one of the most dispersed countries in the world. For administrative functioning, the 26 natural networks are categorized into the capital island, Mahale, as the main urban center. <coughs> Out of the 345,000 Maldivians, one third of the population resides in the capital city, and the remaining two thirds are scattered across the 199 inhabited <coughs> islands. Tourism is the largest industry in the Maldives, accounting to 28% of the GDP. Maldives has used its isolation as its main appeal. The one island, one resort concept in the Maldives that began in the 70s provides an <coughs> unmatched level of privacy the worldwide luxury resort market. But this isolation is also one of the biggest challenges faced by private and public organizations alike. The ocean can oftentimes be a medicine force. Logistics in the Maldives is cumbersome, time consuming, and costly. Part of British Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and we're delighted to be supporting that. Our role is to convene discussions, round table discussions, normally a bit smaller than this. And on Thursday, we have a, uh, an exciting meeting in the High Commission of the, of the British High Commission um, for, uh, uh, to continue some of this discussion with some of the um, uh, a few, few thought leaders from ASEAN. And we're just giving you a taster of some of that discussion here today. And I'm really delighted to have and uh, to be joined uh, on this panel uh, by three people to start this conversation. Uh, on my left is Amanda Selvaratnam, who founded uh, and now directs Training Gateway UK, which is an organisation uh, out of the University of York in the north of the United Kingdom, uh, for those of you trying to get your geography right. Uh, and she's linking the higher education and the corporate, uh, the corporate world. On my right, very distinguished uh, guest, we're delighted to have Tenshri Bhavasir Jones, sorry, Salim, thank you so much sir, for joining us between education and the private sector, uh, and a unique experience in, in university leadership, currently as Chancellor of Taylor's University, but also Chairman of two other universities, and I gather those are both in the public and, the, and private, and, and I was learning a little bit about um, Taylor's and, and, and uh, UPM, uh, where you've got huge interest in, in agriculture, very practical um, skills, uh, education and life sciences. Um, and uh, last but by no means least, Susan Milner, who's uh, direct, Education Director of South Asia, Southeast Asia for the British Council, uh, covering the responsibility for ASEAN countries, based here in Kuala Lumpur. And she uh, previously worked for the British Council in Beijing, so she led uh, UK's engagement with China on a lot of different aspects of education and la led large scale reform programs in China and, and East Asia. So, uh, uh, involved in uh, the education. Um, in, in Asia. So we've got uh, 30 minutes uh, to cover this okay, huge stuff. So welcome. Um, my next panelist is uh, Brian Scott from, uh, she's a principal when Wenoma, 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 Australia. Um, she's been principal of the school, the K-12 Independent Girls School in Sydney, Australia since July 2011. 
And prior to this role, she was principal of Roseville College, an Anglican school for girls, and head of the senior school at Oxford Falls Grammar School. And before teaching, Dr. Scott worked as assistant analyst with Olivetti in Italy and the UK. And she specialised in motivation, technology, and gender equity, and communicates in community forums and conferences on education, parenting, and the marvels and joys of working with adolescents. And finally, uh, Craig Glass, he's the senior vice principal, uh, Hale Marie in Australia. Um, Craig uh, joined the school in 2006 as assistant principal. In 2007, he was appointed vice principal. Um, and in 2010, he began his current role as senior vice principal. Um, Haleybury is Australia's largest independent school with over 3,600 students on four campuses. They've just opened a campus of local students. It's responsible for the school's curriculum development uh, and its delivery across the four campuses. And previously, Craig uh, had a senior leadership role in independent schools, including the head of uh, St. Gilda Road campus and Wesley College and was head of senior school at both the campuses of Wesley College and head of senior school at Cary Grammar School. So we have a very distinguished panel with us today to go through the questions. Um, <laughs>